I'm Ellen McRae Greytack. I'm the director of bioinformatics at Parabon Nano Labs. And we do DNA phenotyping, so predicting a person's appearance, ancestry, um, all that stuff from just from a DNA sample. We start from what we call genotype to phenotype data. So that just means a big database where on thousands of samples we have both information about their phenotypes, like say eye color. We have, are their eyes blue, green, brown? And we also have genotype SNP data. So we have got about a million SNPs on each person and their genotypes, so that's their AA or are they GG at each site. And what we want to know is, which of those SNPs is significant for eye color? So we basically look through at each individual SNP and score how well does this data associate with the phenotype data. If people who have an AA at this SNP always have blue eyes, well, that would be a really strong association. It's never that simple, but that's what we're looking for. But the thing is, it actually gets much more complicated than that. If you look through the literature in genomics, you find what they call missing heritability which means there are these traits that we know are genetic, they pass through families, they're very clearly heritable, but when we look across the genome, we don't actually find all the information to explain all the variation in that phenotype. So that's missing heritability. We're only explaining some of the heritability. And one idea for what might be missing is actually interactions among SNPs. So you might have a set of five SNPs that each of them individually has no effect on phenotype, but if you look at all five of them together, there are certain combinations of genotypes that have a significant effect. But if you've got a million and you need to look at five-way combinations, that's way more than you can ever test. I mean, you'd be doing calculations till the end of the universe. We don't have time for that. So what we've done is we've developed software that's called an evolutionary algorithm or a genetic algorithm. And so what it does is it starts from a random population and it's, we're still doing scoring. We're looking at this combination of SNPs and scoring how well does this predict that phenotype. If it scores well, it gets to survive and breed and mutate and we get to look all around it at other possible combinations of SNPs. If it scores poorly, then it dies off. It doesn't get to get searched around. So in that way, we're trying to explore the important parts of the space while not wasting the rest of our lives looking at the entire space. So that's how we're trying to discover SNP associations that haven't been found before. So that's just the data mining. <laughs> then we build it into a predictive model. So we take those SNPs that we found and we say, okay, we know that that AA genotype is highly associated with blue eyes. So in our predictive model, it would say, if I see AA, I'm going to give a higher probability to blue eyes. That's basically what the predictive modeling is. So for kinship, we also started from scratch. It's a, it's a similar approach where we also have a database, except now instead of eye color being our phenotype we want to predict, it's well, I have these two genomes and they're related at this distance. They're third degree relatives, for example. So we're taking the same approach, except instead of looking at each genotype, now you have two genomes you have to look at. And so what we're looking at is how similar are these genomes? And can we use that information to predict the relatedness? And so we've got a database that goes out to, there are actually seventh degree relatives in there, as well as many unrelated pairs. Uh, and we're using this to predict some uh, two people's relatedness. And the value of that for forensics, um, it's twofold. It could be maybe the perpetrator of this crime is related to another perpetrator, a victim, um, a neighbor, you know, any, you could test any pair of people that you suspect might be related. The other possible use is if you have remains and you don't have an immediate relative to test, you don't have a parent um, or a first sibling, but maybe you have a cousin and you suspect that it might be this person's relative. Well, now you can test their DNA and see, does it match the relationship of someone of a third degree relative? Well, the challenge with faces is basically to describe a face in a way that can be predicted. So from our point of view, if you can measure something, you can predict it as long as there's some underlying genetics. So what we do is we take the face and turn it into just a combination of variables. How wide is the face? How long? How angular? How big is the nose? All of those can be turned into numbers 
that can then be predicted. So we're looking exactly in the same way that we did with eye color. We're looking for what are the genes that are involved in this? How can they be used to predict what this person's face like? This specific person whose face is somewhere along all of these variables, you know, maybe their face is wide and short or long and narrow, all of those things are somewhere in that face space, what we call it. We just need to be able to predict those variables. So when we use this for casework, what we try to do is emphasize both what we can predict and what we can exclude. So we don't just say this person has blue eyes because a lot of the time, maybe this person has dark blue eyes. They're sort of on the line between blue and green and it's very difficult to predict or even know looking at them, are their eyes blue or green? And so that is going to hurt our confidence. So when we ever, whenever we report a result, we say this person has blue eyes, and we have 75% confidence in that, for example, because maybe their eyes are green. However, maybe we can also say with 99% confidence, this person does not have hazel, brown, or black eyes. And that's when, that's what's really important for investigators. We can tell them you don't need to look at the people in your suspect list who have dark eyes because they really do not match this profile that we've come up with. And there's only maybe a 1% chance that this person has dark eyes versus a 99% chance that they have blue or green eyes. So that's what we try to focus on is how can you use this information to narrow a list of possible matches. And so we've been using this in casework. Uh, we've done several dozen cases at this point um, where investigators come to us say this, I've had this case hanging over me for years. I have no witnesses and I just don't know who to look for. If they still have DNA from that case, we can do our genotyping assay, analyze that and tell them, okay, you're looking for someone who matches this profile and this vast majority of the people that you see walking down the street are not going to match that profile. So you need to focus in on this smaller subset of your possible matches. What we really want to see in the future, as this is getting out there, you know, like I say, now it's mostly that oldest, worst cold case. But you know, imagine now a, a crime occurs, and before you spend five years looking at every person around, if you narrowed it down to you know five percent of the population, suddenly, okay. I'm lonely looking for this blue-eyed person, and you know, that's really gonna change the efficiency of these investigations, and that's what we're looking for going forward. <laughs>